If only people knew. Imagine if this knowledge was given, this simple knowledge was given to everyone as part of their education. That think of, think about whatever you like, study whatever you like, explore whatever you like, but don't, don't uh, um, understand one thing. That that for which you long for the most in life, that which you love above all else resides simply in the knowing of your own being as it is. It's so simple. It's so obvious. And it should be given freely to everyone. It should be on the curriculum before we study maths and English. And this is just this basic knowledge, that simple knowledge. And then these very simple methods that we discussed earlier with, with Nick. These, these, just these simple questions. But what is essential to myself? What, what never leaves me? What is always with me? What cannot be taken away from me? Am I aware? What is the I that has been present all my life? These simple questions that give us direct and immediate access to ourself as it is. And, and as a result, the source of peace and happiness. Whole, whole religions, uh, whole spiritual practices whole, are, are, are built around this simple knowledge. This is the essence of all the great religious and spiritual traditions. This is the single understanding, the single, simple understanding upon which all true religious and spiritual traditions are founded. Why? Have they become so elaborate? Why so much paraphernalia in all the religions, in the Buddhist and the Christian and the Hindu? And why so much paraphernalia? Just because people don't, people don't understand the simplicity and the directness of this, and therefore they raise objections. And in order to meet those objections, the teaching begins to elaborate itself. To, if the simple pathway, the direct pathway, who am I? Am I aware? What is the essence of my own mind? What never leaves me? If this simple, direct, immediate approach doesn't seem to work, the teaching has to elaborate itself in order to account for the, the difficulties and the objections of, of, of the mind. And for this, in this way, the, the teachings become complex and they grow further and further and further away. And we end up with a whole elaborate system of, of practices and precepts and belief and, and everything. But all, all that it is, the, the, the culmination, all these practices, and, and, and they're all preparations for simply the knowing of our own being as it is. They all lead to that in the end. And what is called the direct path, which Ramana Maharshi referred to as self-inquiry, Atmananda called it, Krishna Menon called it the direct path. Is this going directly from ourself to ourself, which is, of course, no, there is no distance. It, it, it is going from King Lear to John Smith, and, of course, there is no distance between King Lear and John Smith. It is, this is the, 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 the essence of all the great religious and spiritual traditions. Just this being with ourself. First of all, this investigation into ourself. And then once having, having recognized what the self is, this is abidance. This is where I was saying to Nick, the term at Vichara, it starts off as an investigation into ourself, and then it evolves into simply the abidance in ourself, or the abidance as ourself. That is the essence of meditation and the essence of prayer. Simply this abidance as the self. It's so simple. The belief system of our world culture is now clashing with your experience. What's the belief that... The belief is that... Consciousness, and this was what your question was, 
consciousness is known by the finite mind. That, that's, that's, the, that's materialism. That's the, the belief. Consciousness depends on the body. Right. It clashes with your experience, but you cannot quite, when I say you, your, your mind cannot quite accept the implications of your experience. Naturally. Like, like Albert Camus said after he went to visit Jean Klein a couple of weeks before his death, he came out and he said, I just can't believe it. <laughs> he, he obviously had this recognition. Uh, but he said, it's just too much. I can't believe it. It's, it. It competes so profoundly with my beliefs. I'm not willing to let my beliefs go. This model that there is an exterior world made out of dead inert stuff called matter. We are so, even those of us who have been on the spiritual path for 20, 30, 40 years, that, that the deep belief that matter is the reality of experience. Because it's, it seems to be our experience. Because it seems to be. Because that's what the senses tell us. Einstein said, common sense, the evidence of the senses, is just a series of prejudices that most people adopt by the age of 18. Or the evidence of the senses is, is just prejudice. We cannot look to the evidence of the senses if we want to know about reality. We have to look to the nature of the one that knows the senses. Unless we know the nature of the knower, nothing true about the known can be known. That is why the science of consciousness is the ultimate science. It has to be. I, I know that this debate, is, Parmenides called this debate a debate between the way of truth and the way of opinion. It's the, what we're talking about here, the way of experience or the way of belief. What are we going to test the reality of our experience with? There are two possibilities. It's either experience or it's belief. What are we going to rely on? We have to agree that we have to agree that something, we're going to measure the truth of our experience against something. Is it going to be a series of beliefs that we've adopted from our culture? Or is it going to be experience? That's the only thing I ask you to agree about here, is to make experience the test of reality. Is it such an outrageous proposition? Why should we be surprised that as consciousness contracts into a finite mind, why should we be surprised that, that, that this collapse or contraction into a finite mind does not take place according to certain laws or habits? Why not? If, if the infinite consciousness has to become a finite mind, it has to do so through a process of contraction. It, it does so through a, a series of filters, as it were. And that, that process, uh, there's nothing to, no reason why that process should not have, a, uh, have laws or patterns or habits. In other words, I'm not suggesting that the, what we now call the laws of nature are not, are not real laws. I'm just upgrading the laws of nature and, and considering them to be laws of mind, not laws of matter. They are laws that govern the way our mind unfolds in consciousness rather than laws that govern the way matter behaves outside consciousness. But there can still be laws that govern the unfolding of mind in consciousness. And because mind is, because each of our minds is a result of this process of contraction, therefore, therefore our minds are subject to the laws through which they have evolved. 
So our minds are, so that there is a symmetry between what we see out there and the mind through which they are perceived. Because what we see out there is always seen or known in through the filter of the mind's limitations. So there is a, what corresponds, uh, there's a correspondence between the inside and the outside. Because the outside is a reflection of the mind through which it is seen. There is a corresponding between the orange snow and the orange glasses. When you put on orange glasses, you don't see green snow. There is a very close correspondence between the limitations of the mind, the orange glasses, and the way reality appears. Is it surprising that, 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 that we have five senses? Is it a coincidence that we have five senses and that there are only five ways, f five forms in which the way the world appears to us? The world only appears to us as sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells. Is it a coincidence that our mind only consists of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting and smelling? No, <laughs> there's a very close correspondence between them. If we had only four of those senses, the world would only appear to us in four forms. Or if our mind were capable of eight different senses, then the world would have eight different forms. There would be five other ways of perceiving the world, which our minds cannot conceive because it's limited to five senses. So there is this very tight correspondence between our minds and the world. Why? Because they are refractions of the same indivisible whole. One is the subjective element of that whole and the other is the objective element of it. They're not really separate from each other. The, the mind is itself a limitation of the reality that it is seeking to know. Because the mind is not something apart from reality. It, it is obviously a part of reality. But it is obviously a limited version of that reality. So everything, in other words, reality knows itself through the agency of each of our minds. But everything it knows of it, everything reality knows of itself is limited by the limitations of our mind. That is why we, we cannot say that all there is to reality is the content of our minds. There may be very much more to reality than the content of our own minds. We can't say that because our minds are limited. In other words, our minds filter reality and make reality appear in a way that is consistent with our own limitations. Which is another way of saying the world is a reification of the limitations of our own minds. An objectivization of our own minds. If our own <coughs> minds were different, the world would be different. Unlimited reality has no form. That which is unlimited has no form. Infinity doesn't have a form. Infinite consciousness has no form. So it's not possible for the finite mind to know reality as it is, because it will always see reality through its own limitations. So our finite minds cannot know what things really are. Physicists will never find out what things truly are, because uh, with their minds, because their own minds superimpose their minds superimpose their own limitations on the reality they are trying to investigate. The only knowledge that is independent of the limitations of the mind, the only knowledge that is not subject to the limitations of the mind is consciousness's knowledge of itself. And that is why it is said to be absolute knowledge. It is not relative to the limitations of our mind. So the, and that is what, absol that's what meant, is meant by absolute truth. The only absolute truth there is, is consciousness's knowledge of itself. Because it is not subject to any limitations. All other knowledge and experience is relative to the limitations of the mind through which that knowledge and experience is known. And therefore cannot said to be absolute, it is relative knowledge. So it is impossible for science to know 
the absolute truth, by science I mean a, a series of thoughts and perceptions. But to know itself, consciousness doesn't need a finite mind, it knows itself by itself, in itself, as itself, and that is why this n consciousness is knowledge of itself, which is our knowledge of ourself, that is the knowledge I am, the simple knowledge I am, is the highest knowledge there is. It is why it said that I am, the knowledge I am, is God's presence in our minds, in our hearts. Because God, or absolute truth, shines in our experience as the simple knowing of our own uncolored being, the knowledge I am. So right there, at the very heart of our experience, each of us, everybody, has access to the absolute truth through the experience simply I am. When you're having the dream, as you say, the, the time, the space and the objects that appear in your dream seem to have a reality that is as real as the time, the space and the objects that are present now in the waking state. Yeah? And you wake up and you realize that they weren't real in the way you thought they were real when you were dreaming. However, it was a real dream, yes? It, it, yes. The experience of the dream was a real experience. Mm -hmm. It had a reality to it. Something was real. It wasn't nothing, yeah? It was a dream. Mm -hmm. Okay, it turned out later not to be what you thought it was. In other words, its reality turned out to be different from what you imagined in the dream. Nevertheless, it had a reality to it. Now, when you woke up, you discovered what the reality of the dream was. What was it? What was its reality? What, what gave it its realness? Um, well, it seemed like the mind did. Yes. It, you, you, you realize when you woke up, oh, it was made out of mind. Mm -hmm. It wasn't made out of wood and right. concrete and glass. It seemed to be a street and shops and houses mm -hmm. made out of this stuff called matter. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up and I realized, yes, it was real. There was something there, but it wasn't what I thought was there. What, what was really there was mind, mm -hmm. not matter. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So then we think, okay, the dream wasn't real as a dream. It was just made out of mind. But this is real. Well, I'm starting this, to question you're that. You're quite right to question it. You're <laughs> because quite right it's to. happening too exactly. much. Exactly. But what the waking state mind says, okay. it says exactly the same thing that the dream, the dreaming state mind says. The dreaming state mind says, this is real as separate solid objects. We wake up and the waking state mind says, oh no, it was just made out of mind. However, the waking state mind says, this really is real. Mm -hmm. And it's real as objects made out of stuff called matter. Yeah. So here we wake up a second time mm -hmm. and we realize, just as we realized that the dream was real, it was a real experience, it had a reality to it, mm -hmm. but its reality was not what we thought it was. So we now realize that this experience now is real. Yes, I mean, nobody can deny that this experience is real. Whatever exactly it is, we might not be sure what it is. In fact, we can't be sure that we're not dreaming now. Mm -hmm. I can't. <laughs> we can't be sure because the dream is as real as this when it's taking place. So, however, even if we are dreaming or hallucinating or whatever, nevertheless, it is real. This is, it's a real something. Something is real. Now, what, what is real about this experience? If, if we really explore it, we thought that it was made out of stuff called matter. But actually, our only knowledge of this stuff called matter is seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. Now, what, what is real in the experience of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling? They're real experiences, but what are they made of? Well, since I already had the experience and I woke up from it, I can't 
They're made of. I can't tell you. No, you can tell oh, me it's because made of my mind. Do, do you not know the experience of seeing and hearing and touching? Yes. Yeah. What's it? In other words, you're experiencing. It's real. Yes. The experience of seeing yes. is real. What is it made of? If you had to touch it, g g go now, with, with your, with your, sensory imagination and try to touch the substance that seeing is made out of. Go on. You're an artist. It should be easy for you. <laughs> what is seeing? To reach out your hand, your imaginary <laughs> hand, and touch the stuff that seeing and hearing is made of. What makes it real? If you had to name that substance, what would you call it? It's made of something. Something about it is real. What, what is seeing made out of? Touch the experience of seeing. After all, you're having it. It should be very easy. What, what, what is the material it's made out of? I just find like a translucent nothing. I can't find perfect. A translucent okay. <laughs> nothing. But but it has one. The, the word I'm looking for is knowing. Oh. You, you're knowing it. It's a translucent nothing. You're, you're right. You can't find it. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not nothing. That there is some, Seeing is, is not nothing, is mm -hmm. it? it it's, it's something. But when you try to touch that something, you're, you're quite right. You, you can't find it. It's like a translucent, empty mm -hmm. nothing. But it's yeah. full of knowing. Right. That is its reality. It's made out of the knowing of it. That is its reality. So when we wake up from the dream into the waking state, we realize, oh, no, it wasn't made out of matter. It was made out of mind. Mm -hmm. And now when we wake up again a second time, we realize that all of this, we never in come in contact with this stuff called matter or mind. All we know is knowing. And it is knowing that knows knowing. All we find is ourself, this translucent, empty substance that all of this is made out of. That is our experience. This is not non-dual philosophy. It's your experience. You are looking around trying to find the stuff mm -hmm. that seeing and touching is made out of. And it's like you say, it's translucent. It's empty, but it's full of knowing. Mm. It's empty of apparent objects, but it's full of knowing, knowing only itself. That is the purpose of art, to make that <laughs> clear in our bodies, in our <laughs> in our in the way we perceive and whether we know it or not when we stand in awe in front of a painting or a landscape or a loved one that is what we are experiencing we are dissolving as a so separate solid self the mind of course misinterprets it when it comes back and, but in that moment when, when we're totally silenced in love or beauty or understanding that is what we are knowing at that moment so beauty is not a perception, it is the nature of perceiving, the substance of all perceptions, just as love is the substance of all feelings, and intelligence is the substance of all thoughts. It's the same substance, this translucent, empty knowing. It's always been thought that reality was solid objects. Yes. And even with all the non-dual teachings I've been exposed to over the last several years, I, I haven't seen otherwise until recently with you. And so the, the foundation of reality is shaky realizing that the thoughts, the beliefs, the sensations, and the perceptions are actually all that's going on a as a way to say it. And so the question becomes, like I, I, reality doesn't even seem to be a concept that can be grasped. Is 
awareness, what we say as aware presence, is that what would be said to be reality? Exactly, exactly. Yes, it's, so it's not that, I think the phrase you used was, the foundations of reality have become shaky. It's what we once thought, and more importantly felt, was the reality of our experience, mind and matter. We've now realized that's not the fundamental reality of our experience. We still know that experience is real. This experience we're having now is undoubtedly real. But when we look at what it's made of, it's not made out of a collection of inert objects and living objects and thoughts. It's not made out of thoughts and feelings and sensations and perceptions. If we if we push a little bit further, we see that our, our, all our experience is made of the knowing of it. And that knowing is this totally alive substance of awareness, which it's an empty, transparent substance, but it's the stuff of the fullness of experience. So, yes, it's, it's that it's like we no longer attach reality to objects as objects, to people as people, to thoughts as thoughts. It's like looking at a, a, a movie. If we forget the screen, the trees seem to be real trees, real cars, real houses, real people. There is a reality to the movie. We're definitely seeing something. We think we're seeing real trees, real cars, real people. But then when we start exploring, and that's what we do here, when we start exploring, exploring is going up to the screen. We get closer and closer to the screen. That's what we do here. We get closer and closer to the true nature of our experience. And at some stage we touch the screen. We actually touch the tree and the car and the person. And we find there's no car there. there are, I run my finger across it. It's not lots of separate objects. It's just one seamless screen. Car, tree, house, person was just a name that we superimposed on the screen. It was always only screen. But because we overlooked the screen, at the moment of overlooking, cars and trees and people seemed to come into existence and we thought they were real in their own right. The tree has its own separate, independent reality, independent of the screen. The car, the person, they all have their own separate, independent realities. So it's the same here. We think that, that there are objects, we think that there are people, separate objects, separate people, separate feelings, separate thoughts. But when we go up to all of these, the first step is all we find is thoughts, sensations and perceptions. We take a step closer to the screen, all we find is thinking, sensing, seeing, hearing, touching. We take a step closer to the screen and we find no, all we know is the knowing of thinking, the knowing of sensing, the knowing of seeing. We take a step closer and we realize I am that knowing. I am the, what I call, what we call I is the knowing out of which all of these are made. That's the touching of the screen. All that is known is knowing, and that it is knowing that knows knowing. All there is is the self knowing itself, awareness aware of awareness. That was actually all that was being experienced in the first place. It has always been that. Even when we believed in the separate reality of trees and cars and people, we were still only seeing the screen, in fact, even when we didn't realize it. Even now, if we don't realize it, all that is being known is knowing. All there is is awareness, aware of awareness. Even now, when we seem to be experiencing separate objects, thought, people and things. So this very experience, the reality of this ordinary simple experience, is awareness, our 
ourself right now. That is the case for everyone. But, but some of us have overlooked the presence of awareness, the all-pervasive presence of awareness, and therefore objects, people, thoughts still seem to have their own independently existing, separate reality. Feeling one of those uncomfortable... <laughs> <coughs> okay. But that's perfect. That, that's perfect. You see, the, these... The contemplation, and, and these are not, not the conversation we've just had is, is just one of these little short, loving contemplations on the nature of experience. And we go there. If, if we give ourselves over to the conversation, we, we go there. We're taken there. We go there. And, and, and then at, at the last minute, as we touch the screen, as, as we know ourselves as the knowing out of which all experience is made, the ego, in a last desperate gasp, before it finally vanishes, says, Oh, help, I'm going to disappear. Help. And what you're feeling is, is just that last gasp of the separate self saying, Please, I don't want to go. <laughs> but it's perfect that it comes up. It's perfect. That's what these contemplations are supposed to do. As we walk back to the reality of experience, they are supposed to reveal all the little hiding places of the me, that we thought weren't there. So it's perfect. Don't see this, the appearance of this feeling as, as a failure of your understanding. On the contrary, it's, it's a cooperation of your self with the process. Cezanne's carrot quote, yes, he said, um, a time is coming, and he said this quite some time ago, he said, a, a time is coming when a single carrot, freshly seen, will trigger a revolution. Yes, if, if we truly see any apparent object as it truly is, in other words, not as an object, it will trigger a revolution. And it, it, yes, a, a revolution where the whole edifice, the presumption on which our world culture is built, that matter is the reality of experience and that awareness is fleeting and unnecessary. This whole edifice will come down. Imagine the implications if this understanding was the presumption of our culture. And what kind of a world would we live in? So, yeah, it would trigger a revolution. William Blake said exactly the same thing. When the doors of perception are cleansed, everything will be seen as it truly is, infinite. When the doors of perception are cleansed from this conceptual labeling, when, when the way we see is cleansed of, of, of that conceptual overlay, everything, all apparent things and objects and selves will be seen as they truly are, not finite things, but infinite, infinite awareness. Everything will be seen as the face of God, as the Sufis say. 